Hi, I'm Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer for Vistage. It's a privilege to be here today and to be your host for the latest webinar in our series, Leading in Challenging Times. This series provides the definitive source of thought leadership in the most pressing topics facing small and mid-sized businesses. Combining expert speakers like we have today and peer perspectives is how we help Vistage members make critical decisions that drive growth. Today's focus is on the key things you need to know about HR. Uh, over 60 days, our HR priorities have shifted radically from the focus in, in early February of retaining and hiring people to now trying to retain the people we have and dealing with people that maybe we've had to lay off. It's created a whole series of HR issues and challenges, and we thought it'd be appropriate to bring in one of our very best speakers to help us with this, Hunter Lott. Hunter Lott joins us today. Uh, this gentleman has spoken to over 1,300 Vistage groups, has won every award, every Vistage speaker award that we have, and is in tuned to our community. What I really like in our conversations leading up to this was Hunter's ability to connect directly with our members and our membership because he deals with so many of our groups on a regular basis. Hunter, thank you for being here today. Let's get started. Oh, Joe, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, the invitation. Uh, it's great to be um, even a small part of the of the Vistage community. Joe's uh, right. Um, I, I looked on the calendar this morning, six weeks ago, I'm in Cleveland. I'm doing a Vistage presentation uh, for a group there. And uh, there was a little fist bump and a little elbow, uh, some shaking hands. We were talking about COVID-19, but um, the conversation revolved around oh, well, 3.5% unemployment rate. Uh, probably that week, maybe 250,000 new claims for unemployment. The scramble for talent, finding and keeping the, the, that talent. Now, um, the shock to the system, six weeks later, I gave a virtual Vistage presentation this morning. Uh, the conversation was around reductions in force. Um, you know, how do we handle some of these issues um, as we start to recall uh, corporate culture, communication, um, the um, uh, new claims for unemployment, who knows this week, uh, we hit at one point, we hit 6.3 million new claims for unemployment. Uh, so this has been a shock. Um, kind of where are we now and what have we learned and what can we option uh, on the other side? First thing we know, uh, the number one is to work from home. Um, that um, old expression, horses left the barn. Uh, work from home will be a permanent part of most workplaces in the new normal, whatever and whenever uh, that looks like. It, it, I mean, and the Vistage community is a great example. We have talked about, you know, virtual and the speakers and the chairs and the members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of us were really, you know, enthusiastic. Okay, fine. Uh, and then, boom. Uh, this happens. Uh, four days later, I'm taking Zoom, you know, online classes. Uh, I'm scrambling for, uh, you know, all the equipment, uh, and and we're up and going. Um, for most members, it's been a surprise how productive um, people have been. Um, the introverts are thrilled. Uh, I mean, some are going, this is great. Uh, I don't have all those extroverts back at work bugging me. Um, but there are some issues in terms of, okay, how do we manage this first? But just, just know that this is going to be part of our options uh, for some of us more than others, but it will be part of the options. What does that mean? What does it look like going forward? Um, I'm going to start with some kind of work from home policy um, and decide, okay, here are uh, expectations that we have in terms of setup, your ability to communicate. Um, how we're going to communicate, uh, I mean, productivity and behavior. Uh, I mean, we're going to take a, a second look at um, job descriptions and, and what they mean. One great way here is to think backwards. Good HR people, we think backwards, and that's what drives most decision makers crazy. Um, we're going, okay, wait, how are you going to enforce this? Okay, wait, what's this going to look like? Are we just going to turn the lights on one day again and everybody shows up? No, it's probably going to be phased in. Well, do I need less office space then? Probably. More conference space? Um, certainly social distancing will probably be here <laughs> until we get some kind of vaccine or whatever. Well, that's 12, 18 months. Um, start to think 
backwards. I will outline and start to work on now what's working in my virtual reality, working from home, not working from home. Um, how do I maintain the culture? Uh, I, I may, oh, you know, three days a week, oh, they're working from home. Two days a week, we have core hours, all hands on deck. So we don't lose that kind of energy. Uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna take a hard look now at, at where I am and, and how I manage this. One thing for sure, it's harder to micromanage <laughs> when, when it's virtual. Uh, and most managers really balked at virtual because line of sight. Hey, if I can't see them, how do I know they're working? I said, well, how do you know now? Well, I just know. Well, what do you mean? Well, well, Joe's a great employee. Well, how do you know? I just know. Trust me, in my gut, I know. They said, well, okay. Um, certainly some jobs like sales and some other jobs, you can you can see the results much um, easier to make um, objective. Um, and that's what we're gonna have to do for uh, all of our job descriptions. What are uh, the objectives? How do we measure productivity in a virtual environment? Um, there's gonna be a focus not so much on how things get done as what gets done. Um, so, you know, here's the project, here's what we need, here's the deadlines. If you've got any kind of barriers, you let me know, and then you're on your own. Um, you'll be amazed how creative employees are in how they get it done, um, in terms of timing, you know, in, in terms of managing what's going on at home. Um, much more focus on the what uh, than on the how. Um, it, it is, um, one guy this morning, he was saying, oh yeah, we're, we're tracking all the email activity and seeing that everybody is communicating with each other. I said, well, okay, uh, but there's gonna come a point where I can't babysit anymore. Really, the frontline supervisor is gonna be tracking all these emails back and forth all day long? Um, I mean, they were gonna have work to do. Um, so so th this is gonna force us to get out of the babysitting business, get very, um, um, focused on, all right, what is a, a, a productive employee in this job? How do we measure the productivity? How do we measure the behavior? Um, this is a, the balance of performance, behavior, performance, behavior. Um, a lot of questions about the, the corporate culture and how do I maintain that? Well, well your culture, is defined by the behavior you hire for, uh, fire for, reward and tolerate. We know this before. I mean, one thing about HR, uh, what we're learning is, <laughs> HR has been you know, screaming about communication and screaming about documentation. These are old school HR ideas. And in a, in a stressful, in a crisis, boy, this is kind of bubbled up to the top. Yeah, uh, communicate, 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 documentation, documentation, documentation. That hasn't changed. Um, in terms of sending the message of who we are and what we're doing and expectations to what the employee doing, that's what changed. And that kind of leads us to our next slide, number two. Hey, uh, Hunter, before we go to number two, can we go back to work at home for a minute? Just because this is this was a topic um, that was emerging anyway. We saw, you know, almost 30% of our of our businesses prior to this had some type of work from home capability. We know that the millennials and the Gen Xers coming up that they this is something that's important to them. And now it feels as if the genie's out of the bottle on this. Uh, one of our members was, you know, kind of a traditional 30-person law firm, and instantly in 30 days they change and they're working virtual and they're finding ways to make it work. So do you see that in the, in the in a new reality that this will be part of a blended environment? Will we ever go back to everybody there all the time? You mentioned it earlier, but this is really going to be one of those trends that we're going to evolve as we get to the new reality. Yeah, I, I think so. Now, now, each of us are on kind of a different timeline um, in, in this whole process. Some companies, as you said, are already kind of virtual. Um, other companies are on the other extreme said, no way, I'm going to this. But now they've had to. 
Well, so given that they've, the genie's out of the bottle, given that they've had to do this, that they're going to take a hard look and go, whoa, this worked a whole lot better than I thought it ever could. Um, and so is this an option then in, in terms of retaining staff? Yes. Or attracting staff? We will be hiring again on the other side. Um, so can I offer this as a, a flexibility issue in certain job descriptions or dealing with it case by case? I um, mean, you know, I've always said working from home is a privilege. Um, so if I, I've got a superstar employee that I totally trust, I don't have any problem on even a short term basis, given some personal issue that they work from home. Uh, other people, no, I, I, I don't trust them and I see them every day. Um, <laughs> so no, we're, we're not going to we're not going to go there. This is a privilege. Um, so but it's going to be part of, I think, everybody's work environment to one extent or another. Um, so whether you're, you, you know, you're hanging on and hoping not to go through a riff or, or whether you're on the other side and starting to recall or, or whether it didn't really affect you that much in terms of your business, uh, I think this work from home option, uh, you're right, it, is going to be a permanent part of the new normal. All right. Thank you. Let's look at communication. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. I mean, HR, this is an old mantra. Uh, but boys, it's been driven home. I can tell you that if you're silent, um, I talked to a manager yesterday, uh, and he says, I'm getting all kinds of grief um, from employees. And I said, well, um, are you talking to them? Well, yeah, I talked to them. What do you mean you talked to them? So well, I talked to them in February. I said, February? Well, we went through the reduction in force. That was a couple weeks ago. I talked to them then. And I talked to them before that in February. <laughs> I said, wow. Um, he goes, HR's on my case. I said, I don't blame him. Um, if you have silence, the natural tendency of people is to fill it with the negative. Oh, they will assume the worst, especially in a stressful situation like we're in now. And with all the noise from the TV and, and all the stuff going on, um, they're going to fill any silence with the negative. So what's that mean from a, from a very uh, kind of practical point of view? Um, a lot of employers have had daily meetings throughout this crisis. Here's where we are today. Don't know where we're gonna go tomorrow exactly, but given what we know today, this is the plan. Uh, just communication, um, acknowledging um, that um, uh, you know um, the stress that some of them are under. I think on the other side, a way to leverage this, because um, uh, managers are going to have to get comfortable with this, and that's going to be at least weekly communication on the other side. Um, and this is one-to-one, -one, face to face, whether it's virtual or in person. Uh, this is going to be that kind of communication. HR, we've been talking about this, you know, for for years. The idea of engagement. Uh, but the Gallup numbers show us, and, and, and Joe's got research, um, the, the engagement numbers have moved, what, four points in 17 years. Uh, we're not that good at this. Um, so, so this is going to force us to get better. And I hope that on the other side of this, that we leverage then the communication, that we keep this um, at least weekly meeting with individual. You may have a group and make an announcement. Uh, you try this. Make an announcement, have a group meeting. You think it's all clear. Then start individually talking to some of your direct reports and their interpretation of what you said and where they are. People tend to hear what they want to hear. And so that's where, yeah, I may have weekly meetings, but then with my direct reports, I'm going to be meeting uh, and communicating one to one uh, at, at least every week. OK, what did you get? Where are we? Uh, do you understand what questions can I answer? Um, Marcus Buckingham, um, and I love his, his book on nine lies about work, and he talks about, oh, it's not so much feedback. His research shows it's attention. Employees need attention. Now, the old school, oh, you know, I don't care. I don't know what all this community, nobody to me. That's how I got promoted. Heads down, focus on work. I don't care about your life outside of work. Your dogs, your cats. About your, your life, I don't care. Just come to work, shut up, and go home. Well, good luck with that. Well, that was kind of off the table before, and now it's just totally disappeared. Like I said, silence, they'll assume the worst. 
Um, next slide shows um, uh, hey, Hunter, nine lines we, about. Hunter, before we go to the next slide, you know I'm going to jump in on every one of these. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Those, can't of, you, help, those I can't... of you in the vintage community that have seen me, you know that, that I go with interruptions. We don't save everything <laughs> to the last. Well, then you'll be comfortable with this because I'm going to interrupt a lot. Um, I, I have to connect the dots between communication and work from home. The communication protocols we had with everybody in the office, we're in this temporary state, we moved to a hybrid state. How do those protocols change when we're in this little two by two box? Yeah, um, one much more structure. So uh, in a virtual world, you know, every Tuesday morning, hands on deck. Um, and here's it's 9 12 to 10 12 every Tuesday morning, barring some kind of emergency. So, much more structure. So, the employees can log in on a virtual and know, okay, we're going to hear from Ann, we're going to hear from Joe, we're going to hear from the group at, at, for this hour every Tuesday morning. Uh, and, and that kind of routine. Uh, those of you the parents, you understand how important routine is to your kids. Same thing with employees. So the virtual will force much more of the, the kind of routine. Um, and, and then um, it, it will also mean uh, as we do you know, group meetings virtually uh, every week that each individual supervisor has that one-to-one -one with the employee. You know, what did you hear? How can I clarify? What questions can I ask? Um, and that is between that supervisor and the employee. They can schedule if they want. They just, you can just random as the employer do that. Uh, but you're going to see this combination of very structured, hey, uh, the meeting's at 10 o'clock. Everybody signs on. This is how we do it um, in a virtual world. And then uh, follow up uh, the one-to-ones and not an email. Um, email only counts for 10%, words, about 10% of the real meeting. The rest is voice tone and body language. On virtual, you get some of that. You, you don't get all the energy you would in a room, uh, but you get at least some voice tone and body language. Whereas if you're just communicating versus email, believe me, especially under stress, employees are just going to fill all those gaps with whatever they can make up. And you'll only know that is if you follow up with one-to-one, um, face-to-face um, -face type meetings at least every week. Thank you. Yeah. And, and here's the question that on, on the slide about nine lies. I love this from Buckingham. Yep, there's all kinds of theories, all kinds of data, but let's break it down to very, very practical. What can I do now? Um, it's about attention. Um, every week you, you set up a, a contact with your direct reports. Two questions. What are you working on? How can I help? What are you working on? How can I help? Um, very basic, very simple. Some conversations will take longer, some will take not very long, but just the employee knows you're paying attention and you're there. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, my office is always open, come in anytime. Yeah, that might have worked in the office, but in a virtual, no chance. So I'm going to have to take the lead uh, as the decision maker. I'm going to reach out. What are you working on? How can I help? And, and if the manager gives you pushback, I don't have time to do this, uh, then you say, well, uh, maybe we never, maybe we need to think about you and management going forward. Because if you don't have time to do this, then you're not doing your job. Or if you don't have time to do this, you may have too many direct reports, uh, and that'll kind of self-regulate. Um, but it's going to be about attention. It's, it's going to be about communication. Um, it's a great way then to leverage kind of what we're going through now on the other side. Number three. Next slide. Brand. <laughs> What's your HR brand? What's your HR reputation? Um, you've seen stories, and so have I. And you've seen videos of um, business leaders, politicians, companies. And you look at it and you go, what were you thinking? That video, those comments are going to come back to bite you. Um, how long people remember, usually in, in times of stress, employees are going to remember this a long time. Um, when I talk to employers about um, reductions in force, I, I tell them, remember, yes, we're compassionate with the people who are, are, are leaving, and we do everything to support them. Um, those are tough conversations. But your real issue are the survivors. Don't think for a minute that, that your survivors have any kind of downsizing or back. They're going, woo! 
I made it. No, they're going to be watching how their coworkers were treated. And there's a guilt factor here. Oh, boy, in some companies, oh, there's one that's on the internet that I guess, and again, if the stories are true, uh, that just had a Zoom meeting and called up hundreds of people. And then all of a sudden the screen went black and there's this voice. If you're on this Zoom meeting, it means you've lost your job. There'll be a truck uh, <laughs> at your place of, of a home within four days to pick up all the equipment. But I guess as, as, this, as this robot was talking, then IT started uh, eliminating. Uh, and so if you're sitting there, you're just seeing boom, 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 boom. There are all your friends and coworkers disappearing from the screen until you're gone. Oh my gosh. You better believe that um, not only the people that happened to, but their survivors are, are going to remember that. Oh, now, for how long? Who knows? But what is your HR brand? Um, I've been amazed at how many websites have absolutely nothing on them. So, you know, my one of my favorite little restaurants. Uh, after this started happening, I'm, you know, on the website, and do they have a reduced menu? Are they doing delivery? What are they doing? And there's nothing on there. I thought, well, well, come on. And then my dentist, it's like nothing happened. My chiropractor, <laughs> nothing happened. And I know this is hard to think of. Uh, after I was ranting on this the other day, I caught myself. I go, wait a minute. What have I done on my website? Uh, and so I talked to my web guy yesterday and I said, uh, I said, Thomas, we need to put a, a call to action, uh, make some kind of offer where I can help out people uh, as related to COVID-19 and HR. Uh, so we're getting that up right away. Um, but but again, uh, people are going to remember. Tell your story. Um, there's going to be opportunities to um, uh, on the on this other side to poach to get some real talent. I doubt that we're going to go right back to a, a 3.5 percent unemployment rate. And and it's hard, but, but just comparison after 9/11, um, I looked at the numbers. It took about four years to get back to the same unemployment rate it was before. Um, Great Recession, 2008, it was about six years before, about 2014 before we got back. Some companies may come back from this pretty quickly. Others, it's going to take a while. So I, I want to tell my story. Um, there better be a testimonial on your website of employees saying what a great place it is to work. Uh, and if you've got some quiet heroes or your company's stepping up and doing something, you better be telling that story. If there's not a video on there, if there's not a testimonial, that means you can't find one employee to say anything nice about you. Yeah, Hunter, you started you started talking about your brand and then how you went through the process of, of releasing or furloughing people. Right. As we get to the other side, how are you going to how is your brand going to help you retain your free agents? Because the fastest way to restart your business is to bring back people who know the jobs. And more importantly, maybe it's a chance to, to upgrade and get better talent and poach other people's talent as everybody's basically a free agent on the other side of this. Yep. Yeah. Um, answer the why question. Why should an A player work for you? Why should an A player come back? Hey, believe me, on recalls, don't assume that everybody's coming back. I mean, this is a decision making kind of on talent. Don't assume that A players are coming back. This is a reset, not only for companies, but for individuals and in their personal situation, family situation. They may not come back. So don't make that assumption, but answer the question. Okay, why? Why would an A player want to work for you? Why would an A player want to come back? How did you treat people all during this whole crisis? I mean, you got to answer the why question because otherwise you're pretty much wasting your time. I mean, I, members who've seen me, you know, I'll point to a member and, and I'll say, give me one good reason an A player should come work for you. And they can't tell me. I mean, they think opportunity, growth, culture. What does that mean? What separates you from the employer down the street? I think one thing you'll see is that A players are going to look for stability. If you were able to hang on throughout this process and you were able to, to uh, you know, keep as many employees as you could and, and pay their benefits, uh, and, and if you could keep them on payroll through this, that's going to be a real plus. 
and I'm going to tell the story on the other side because I, I think that stability will become one of those characteristics now that A players are going to look for. Uh, but this is all part of kind of building our brand, telling our story. This was important before COVID-19. I think it's going to be critical on the way back. Uh, how, do you, how, how do you protect brand if you have to go through a, a second wave of layoffs? If you have to go yeah. through, or maybe you go to furlough. I mean, how do you protect this brand you spent, you spent years building and now is getting crushed like everything yeah. else? I've talked to several employers over the last um, couple of weeks who say, you know, we've been around 100 years and we've never, ever gone through a reduction of force. Um, and so the, the, the key there is just honest communication. Uh, you be factual. Uh, you share the numbers. This is what's happening. Um, I'm as compassionate as I can with, with the people that are leaving. I've got a, a portal where I can I can help them walk through the unemployment and what that means, the documentation it may take. Um, I try to hang on on a furlough and, and pay all benefits if if I can to keep some of those people on the books. Um, I, I, everybody's kind of going through this together. Um, most people will understand these are hard conversations, uh, but um, the things you don't want to do is avoid it and then you know send a Zoom meeting and shock them. Well, this isn't going to help your brand. Or, you know, every week somebody else goes down. Again, that's pulling the Band-Aid off one little hair at a time. Think backwards. What's it going to look like? We're going to have one big, ugly Thursday. Here's what we're going to do. I've, I've um, communicated to management. They're going to make um, within 24 hours calls to the individual survivors. Uh, we're going to create everything we can to help the people who um, uh, are going to be affected. Um, it's not a guarantee that, um, uh, that that if you keep all your employees, everybody's going to be thrilled. Uh, it, at the same time, there, there are ways um, with compassion and dignity to conduct the reduction in force. Um, kind of treat them the way you'd want to be treated given the situation. And if you make mistakes, own up to the mistakes. Well, that helps your reputation. I mean, there's going to be plenty of time on the other side to kind of evaluate you know, what we did right, what we did wrong, what worked, what didn't. Uh, but as you're going through it and you make mistakes, um, it, it's like, okay, just get ahead of the mistake and say, yeah, um, the Zoom format had trouble with security. And boy, there was the CEO and he got on, um, did a video and said, yeah, uh, we messed up here. We haven't filled this gap. Uh, we're in the process of doing it. We're going to fix this. Um, and so he acknowledged that there was a mistake uh, and, and they've done um, things to fix their security issues. Um, you and I were talking earlier about Shake Shack giving them PPP money back um, because all of a sudden, and, and good HR people think this way, 60 minutes. Would you want to go on 60 minutes? Would you want to go on TMZ? Do you want to go on live five cam action news uh, and explain that you had you know, $70 million worth of cash in the bank and you went after the PPP money that's going to be exhausted that other people aren't going to get? Oops, um, and, and, and I don't know if it was internal or they got all kinds of grief externally, but boy, there, there they were uh, up front uh, and saying, yes, um, we have found other money. We're giving this money back. Uh, does that um, help their brand? Of course it does. Help their reputation? Yeah. Um, and they made a mistake, whether they realized it or they got pressure either way, got in front of it, Here, here's where we are. Um, these are all things in, in how we treat people. Our culture, again, is defined, large company, small company, based on the behavior, hire for, fire for, reward, and tolerate. Um, and the bigger you are, the more that responsibility comes down to that frontline immediate supervisor. Um, so answer the why question. What separates you from the employer down the street? One of my favorite um, Vistage members said, oh, we only hire B and C players. <laughs> what? We can't afford A players. So we're creating an atmosphere where B and C players want to be A. Um, and, and we're looking at, at videos and testimonials from former employees to say what a great place it is to work. I doubled my money because I went to work at ABC. Uh, I said, okay, now there's a, a unique approach to creating your brand. Um, and those are the kind of things on the other side. Answering the why question, uh, they're going to help um, 
get A players back on a recall uh, to retain the good people you have and hopefully attract other A players who didn't have a good experience going through this. Well, I guess it'll be a real sign of the strength of your culture if you can bring your A players back because they want to be part of what they were part of versus if you're in a job, you're more likely to stay in a job. But if you're a free agent, you, you know, people are interviewing, people are talking, they're evaluating their options. So you had mentioned culture and culture has come up in a number of our other discussions. If you're sitting here at this point in, in the COVID experience and you're realizing your culture is not what you need it to be, what can you do in this time of crisis to begin to make that move? Yeah, um, and, and I'm gonna go back to one-to-one um, -one individual conversations. Um, uh, how can I help? What are you working on? Um, uh, start talking to your A players. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why? Now you'll scare them. Oh, oh, something wrong? I'm being laid off. No, why would you say that? Well, we found out the only people you are talk to are, are the people being laid off. And this is just like before. Uh, the last two people you took to lunch never came back. Um, but this is sending a message that my culture is not what I needed to be before. It's real hard in the middle of a crisis to, to fix this, but I'm going to start. Um, and it means that one-to-one -one communication. Why are you here? What do you like about this place? What don't you? Uh, how can we help? And I start with my A players there. Um, and for those of us that already have done this, um, and whether it's you know, all the way back to who moved, who moved my cheese or Drucker or uh, EOS now, um, that focus on people and culture will, will pay off in times of stress. If you're ha having to start from scratch now on the other side, okay, um, start talking to your A players. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? The communication piece is the very practical part of this in order to, if you're having to start from scratch to build or rebuild a, a very positive culture. Well, hire fast. This is kind of different than the most HR. Hire slow, fire fast. Oh, man. Be so well prepared. I mean, as you look at job descriptions and as you look on the other side as to what these jobs may look like, performance and behavior, then, then look at your model. What, you know, Ann's the best employee I've got in this job. I wish I had 10 of her. Oh, then you say, okay, what is it about Ann that makes her so special? Um, typically, it's not so much the performance piece, it's the behavior piece. She's adaptable, she's willing to learn. Boy, we've already found out, and I've dealt with several members whose employees just refuse to Zoom, refuse to go with the technology. Wow. Uh, one guy, it's a great story. One guy just just uh, can canceled his email. He said, that way nobody can talk to me. Oh my gosh. Uh, adaptable, willing to learn, curious. Um, these are behavior characteristics that are really thriving in this kind of stressful environment. And it's may what I want on the other side. Um, so it, it's not that, you, um, that you, you'll make the offer at the first interview, but be so well prepared in each job description that you know the model, you know the performance and the behavior blend that works, that if you find it, uh, that you're, you, could make that, um, you could make that offer. And here's the behavior piece. Don't think attitude, get rid of the attitude. Attitude is um, age or sex or race discrimination. It's too subjective. Um, it's like arguing with teenagers. If, uh, young lady, you have an attitude problem. What are you talking about? That's what I'm talking about right there. No, it doesn't solve the problem. Go behavior, go behavior. It's behavior. And here's the behavior standard. Maintain positive work atmosphere by acting, communicating in a manner so that you get along with customers, clients, coworkers, and me. Um, this gives you enough room in your policy to say, hey, behavior is important. Uh, and enough room for individual supervisors to make the call whining, rolling eyes and moaning, constantly complaining. Um, no, I, why am I gonna tolerate this? This is a culture thing. Um, and, and how many little private conversations have members had to themselves, oh, I should have dealt with so-and-so before this. Um, yeah, uh, and, and that's part of, the performance, the behavior, the culture, um, 
when I meet miserable, grumpy, whiny, complaining employees, I blame you. Uh, I blame the leader. Uh, you could fix this. Um, you, you kind of bl you blame the law. The law doesn't deal with miserable, grumpy, whiny. They're not protected. Uh, we've made that decision, and it's so much easier. Just wait till the behavior affects the performance. Uh, but any of us who have managed on the front line, we know there are people that can just do enough to get by, but are miserable, grumpy, whiny, and complaining. And uh, honestly, are these the people you want kind of on the other side? Um, so it, it, as you go to look at, at you know, leveraging uh, this behavior piece, put it in the handbook, put it in the, in the offer letter, uh, you're going to evaluate performance and behavior going forward. Every job is at least 50% behavior, some are 90%. But Hunter, as I listen to you talk about this, and I think about our early conversation about this migration to the blended virtual office, how does grumpy whiny get its way when it has to deal with me in a computer? Because I'm not going, I'm not seeing them at the water cooler or the coffee machine or bumping into them, coming in or out. They're not walking by my desk. In this virtual environment, is this going to expose those people more? I, I just, my brain was thinking about that. I know. Well, it's fascinating. It's either going to expose them more or less. I mean, like I said, some introverts are thrilled with this, and I was I was set for an emergency like this. Uh, and they're going to be very comfortable, hunkered down, doing their job. They're very productive. Um, they they don't have a lot of interaction necessarily with customers, clients, or even coworkers. Uh, and and we as managers and leaders kind of you know put them in an office behind somebody, um, and 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 didn't pay much attention. Um, so in some respects, um, for, for those people, uh, then th this environment's going to be perfect for them. And that's going to be a way that, that, you know, hey, three days out of the week, you can work from home. Two days, you need to be on site um, and, and, and dealing with the water cooler issues, the, the, the boilerplate, all the things that happen at, at any kind of workplace. So in some respects, you may be able to, to, to hide. Other respects, um, when people start to get nasty on the internet um, and start to get nasty with email, um, there's a, there's a, they, they feel anonymous. There's like a safety. Oh, it's okay if I say this on the internet. But you would never say that face to face. Um, so those people that, that go that way, uh, you know, everything's all caps uh, and just, you know, sending inappropriate uh, photos, memes, uh, then the employer's going to say, no. We're not gonna we're not gonna tolerate this. This is a behavior piece. This is easy to talk about. Uh, this is hard to do. Um, you you got some really productive people that are miserable, grumpy, and whiny, um, and, and customers like them. You don't even know why. Uh, and, and those people, honestly, you've already kept out of the office. I mean, you can feel the difference with some people when when so and so goes on vacation. It just feels better. Oh, and that's a clue that we've got a behavior issue. Um, so so when, when we're on that side of it, um, I look at behavior as a leadership issue. I mean, this is why you're treated differently at In-N-Out Burger, at Chick-fil-A. This is why you're treated different at Disney, um, because their emphasis on behavior, culture on behavior, how we treat each other, how we treat customers. Um, and, and so on the other side of this, some quiet heroes, you've been really surprised. They've just risen to the occasion under tough times. Uh, and other people you've been disappointed in, in how they've responded, their behavior, how they've treated each other. Um, so in some respects, I think it may be easier to hide for some people and others, boy, it's just going to jump out. Um, what's important for decision makers is you set the call. This is your company. Um, this is your culture. Um, you get to decide what's important and what's not. And you make that decision uh, by how you treat people, how you respond. One of the old HR claims everyone's treated the same just never made sense to me. We don't do this to customers. You treat your best customer, worst customer the same? <laughs> same pricing, same customer service? You won't be in business long. Yet somehow in HR, we get kind of stuck Everyone's treated the same. Oh, you won't get sued. Well, yeah, I won't get sued, but it's like driving 40 in a 65. If I'm driving 40 down the California freeway, um, first, I'm not going to get anywhere. Second, I'm probably going to get run over. Third, I'll get a reputation. Nobody will come with me. 
Um, and, and so that's where um, I am going to treat people differently, not based on their age or sex or race, but based on their performance, based on their behavior. Um, this is not complicated, but it is hard work. And then we're, we're talking about toxic, the HR decision maker dealing with toxic. Um, I love this question. Uh, knowing what you know now about this employee, would you enthusiastically rehire? I mean, Joe, Joe you, you mentioned about the free agents, uh, that if we've gone through a reduction in force, oh, now we the, the, these people are on their own now. Um, like I said, don't assume they may, uh, they'll come back. Why should they, especially if they're A players? Uh, and another decision you gotta make now, do I want them back? I mean, when we're talking recall, well, I'm just not gonna say, okay, just get everybody back here. We're gonna start a week from tomorrow. Uh, wait a minute, what's the job gonna look like? What are my behavior expectations? Has this employee been toxic even before, but and through this? Um, uh, I'm gonna ask um, each one of my managers, <laughs> uh, knowing what you know now about this employee, would you enthusiastically rehire this employee? Would you recall this employee? If not, why not? And what are you going to do about it? Um, th this, um, th th this puts us in the, in the situation as leaders to make the call. How many times have you fired people? And coworkers came up and said, what took you so long? That's a leadership issue. Oh, now, given the COVID-19, I'm gonna be very compassionate here as best I can. Uh, th this may not be the time with every employee, you know, I've kind of tolerated this. Okay, I'll deal with it on the other side. Uh, other decisions you'll make and says, no, I just can't go forward with this based on the new job description and expectations. Long-term employees, you may be offering buyouts as a reasonable way to do this. Um, uh, on the other side, only do that on advice of local legal counsel. Uh, but but what this crisis has done is is force us to take probably 12 to 18 months worth of HR decision making and, and compact it in, in a matter of two, three, four, five, six weeks. Um, and so this is, I think, where, where Vistage becomes so valuable because you can, if I come up with some of these ideas, does this make sense? You can bounce it off of members, bounce it off the chair. Um, this, getting all this outside influence and the, and, and the information gives me options to make better decisions on the other side. Well, your commentary makes me think about, okay, I, I had to furlough people, right? Or I laid them off, whatever that is. They're, they're free agents. I want to bring them back. Now it's time I'm going to begin bringing people back. And yeah, I may I may call the herd a bit because I didn't do that in a normal search. But as I bring them back, I'm not going to bring back everybody at once. It's going to be in waves. How do you manage that messaging? How do you say, well, you know, Hunter, we really want to bring you back. You're just not in wave one. You're in wave seven. That type of thing. How do you how do you position that? Yeah, and and that's going to take just and there's going to be a lot of that. You're right. That's just going to take some honest communication and saying and trying to lay out the plan in front of them. Try to go job descriptions. Hey, um, because we think these customers are going to come to us first. Again, think backwards. Which customers are coming to us first? Well, um, our oil and gas people probably won't, given the environment. But um, restaurants, mm, maybe. Uh, but as, as quickly as you shut down a restaurant, it'll take you weeks to get it back up. Uh, but my, my manufacturing, once they get in, um, we've already, we've got um, back orders here. Um, we, we can ramp up to speed. So wave one is going to be my manufacturing plant in Fontana. Um, and you just try to communicate. Here's kind of our plan. We're, we're, we think the manufacturing customer is coming back first. That will be our first way bringing in those people affected by this group. Um, this group, because um, um, fundraising is critical to our, our, our business, our nonprofit or whatever it may be, then the, 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 um, uh, the fundraisers and their support staff are coming in first. But try to have at least thought through a plan and then communicate it. And saying this is how we're we're taking this this recall back. You're going to hear and tell everyone. You're going to hear from some of your coworkers that they've been called back, and that's great. We're we're trying to piece this meal, uh, piecemeal this as we go. Um, we're sanitizing uh, the office every night. 
uh, we're changing some of the physical location um, so to make the social distancing um, easier. We've got one-way pathways. Uh, we've expanded the conference room so everybody's no closer than six feet. Um, just explain your plan. Explain what you're what you're thinking. Um, some really honest conversation, uh, and it's back to communicate, 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 um, uh, th so that they see it. Okay, they may not agree with it, but they know. Oh, oh, Joe's got a plan. Oh, Ann's got a plan. Okay, I get where they're coming from, and then tell them, this is what we think today. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We may be surprised that, that this happens quicker, or this happens slower, and um, and we reserve the right to kind of move on the fly. But based on what we know today, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. We covered a lot. I, I know it's it's um, it's like a, a fire hose. Um, five ways to leverage what's happened to us. Work from home, here to stay. Uh, use it to your advantage. Communication, keep communicating. Um, there is no such thing as too much in this kind of environment. There'll, there'll come a point when we get back to whatever the new normal looks like. And again, everyone's on different timeline uh, where it'll kind of break down to, but should go no less than weekly one-to-ones. Constantly work on your HR brand, tell your story, tell your story, show a video, um, talk to customers. Um, uh, your best resource in terms of recruiting and retaining is your social media, is your HR brand, is your website. If your website's no good, then you're a no good company. It's not really fair, um, probably not accurate, but that's the perception. And, and especially kind of, um, as Joe said, the free agents, they're going to be looking around, um, you know, who stepped up, who didn't. And then HR decision making, talent. Why would an A player answer the why question? Answer the why question. Uh, HR decision making toxic. Knowing what you know now, would you enthusiastically rehire? Joe, what questions didn't we answer? <laughs> well, Hunter, you, um, we had compiled a, a bunch of questions from our networks and from our members and other sources, and we've answered so many of them. We've gone through this. What we haven't really touched on um, is the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. We saw 84% of our members in our April survey were planning on applying for it. We'll find out in our next survey how many actually did. But there's a lot of questions about now that they've filed and they've got money or they're waiting to get money, now moving into the accounting aspect about you know what qualifies as an employee. Well, what's really an employee? And can this contract or this partial person be this or that? There's that element. And then how do you calculate that and how does that play into the forgiveness aspect? Can you touch on that a little bit for us? Yeah, um, and this the, the PPP program, and as you can imagine, something that gigantic launched that quickly um, has been a challenge. Um, so what we know now, and, and the, the Department of Labor gives us guidance periodically um, through the CARES program. Remember, we had first families, and that's separate from CARES, First family deals with extended family leave and sick leave. That money is refundable under payroll tax. So kind of separate that. Then you drop down to CARES. If you're less than 500 and they played loose and fast with the definition of 500, um, then you can certainly apply for that money. If 75% of that money, based on what we know now, is spent on payroll, payroll related, um, then that uh, will be a grant refundable uh, that will be forgiven going forward um, it, it, as much as you try to attract this and, and, and hey anybody hasn't looked at uh, your interview with uh, with Jack from um, USB yeah, boy take that hour time yeah that's a great webinar on on cares and, and how the accounting kind of looks at it uh, but um, that 75% spent on payroll. Um, and as Jack pointed out, even if, if for some reason parts of this doesn't become refundable, remember it's a 1% you know, loan over a maturity of two years. So that's cheap money. Debt is debt. Um, and try to get as much of that money back as you can. Independent contractors are not considered employees in the formulation. Oh, that's one thing that's come up. Independent contractors may get the unemployment of cares 
Oh, um, um, California finally is going to there on the 28th of April. Uh, other states are getting theirs. My son's kind of an independent gig employee in the entertainment business in New York. Um, and, and he's got his first now um, unemployment check, which is interesting, and then the extra $600 a month through July through the PPP. Any money you spend on COVID related that's PPP, make sure you document this, uh, make sure you've got the general ledger PPP money, know exactly what it's gonna look like on the other side. The IRS is gonna put some kind of form, uh, but until they do, make sure that that money is bundled, that you know what you spent that money on. Um, if, um, if your payroll expenses are the same come the end of June, um, then there may have been some juggling in between now and then, uh, but that also may help you in terms of getting um, money um, forgiven. We'll see, um, Congress is, is, as we speak today, Congress is supposed to tomorrow, the new Will they extend some of this time? I don't know um, if you're already in the queue, that's probably good news uh, in that we're going through about 50 billion a day uh, when they got it ramped up to speed. Um, so document everything, 75% uh, we know has got as we spend on payroll uh, and um, do the best you can in terms of the forgiveness. Um, some companies will be back up to speed and that money will be easy to use and everything will be in line as of the end of June. Uh, other companies, yeah, it's going to be tough to get that back because you're not going to be ramped up where you need to be. I don't have any money to, to, to I, I, I can't bring people back <laughs> just to sit there, right? Now, another issue with CARES that also has come up, Joe, and that's, um, I'm getting all these calls. Well, my employees aren't coming back. They're saying they're making more money on unemployment I just, than they I was just going to ask work. that question. I was just going to ask yeah. that question. How do you deal with someone who's making more on unemployment? Yeah. Well, and and and, and what are you going to say? You know, if you're sitting there and, and you've got a family, you've got bills, and, and you go, okay, if I go back to work, I'm making 18 bucks an hour. If 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 I stay unemployed, I'm making 21 bucks an hour. Oh, and you're going now. You got insurance. You got those other things. Hopefully you have a strong culture that people want to come back and work. So, um, uh, like I said, don't be don't be surprised on recalls if they decide not to come back. And if they get nasty about it, you're going to remember just like they remember you. Uh, but yeah, the one area, all these leaves were meant as a safety net and then maybe to make them whole again except for that 600 bucks a week that came in the CARES program. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only place we see in all this where literally you can make money off of this. And you can look at your state. Um, uh, we did it this morning. We ran the numbers in Alabama. I think it was $270 a week is what they could get. You add that plus the 600 bucks a week and divide by 40. Okay, that's what, they, that's what they're working with. Um, in other states, I think Minnesota, it's over $700 a week plus the $600. Oh, a lot of play politics with this. Um, and, and you're just going to have to say, okay, um, th there's not a whole lot you can do there uh, uh, if somebody has, has make that call. And all you can do is say, well, I hope when this money runs out in uh, July uh, that there's work available and that we're still, uh, that we're still looking for people. But there's no guarantee now. Um, you're on the recall list. We've called you and you've said you're not coming back. Fine. Then you'll go to the bottom of the list and we'll keep going. Well, you, you've said it multiple times from multiple perspectives about how, how you behave now. Uh, people will remember. And I firmly yep. believe that crises are short, but memories are long. And whether it's an employee taking advantage of the company or the company taking advantage of the employee and that brand in the marketplace, there will come a day of atonement for all. And, uh, yep. and with that, you will be rewarded or punished based on what you do. Yeah, and especially like you said, in a digital environment, all this stuff's recorded. All these yeah. texts, you know, um, yeah. are, are 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 public. Um, yeah. And so all those and the PPP is a great example. They listed the the, the largest companies, you know, that, yeah. that with their market caps and what they got. It's public knowledge. Um, yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think memories are long for employees, and there's documentation to back it up. Well, Hunter, let me ask you one more question, and we'll let you let you get back to providing value to all those vested groups. <laughs> and this this again connects to the return to work, right? So maybe in your state, or maybe your company says, okay, it's now safe to return to work. 
but you're a parent with school-aged children and the schools remain closed. And now we go to summer and maybe the camps are closed and the other types of activities I had for childcare in place. So from an employee standpoint, this work from home thing has really kind of worked out for me. But as an employer, you're saying, yeah, they're all hands back on deck. How do you balance that? Yeah, re remember, you look at the leaves available under first families um, and, and the one on extended family medical leave, um, any employer with less than 500, um, there is um, a, a pool there and a federal guideline that if you're unable to come back to work because school's closed or uh, child care is unavailable, then that extended family medical leave will kind of kick in. Um, it's, uh, it's at two, I think, two-thirds the regular rate of pay, so it's a safety net there, and the first 10 days, I think, are unpaid. But that's exactly what that extended family medical leave is for. Um, and so when, when I come down to decision-making and I see there's, there's all these PPP programs, CARES, First Family, there's the state, there's all this stuff that I've got in my company, I kind of layer it and I look at, okay, what's the decision that best... Um, uh, rewards the employee, which is most advantageous to the employee, and that will keep me safe. So if I got a situation like that, I'll say, hey, we've got a we've got a pool of money here. We can do this. It's um, <clears throat> uh, fully refundable under the payroll tax. First families, it's two thirds. It's twelve weeks. Now, after they exhaust all this, um, then it, it's going to be a harder decision. Saying, look. Um, you're able to come to work um, physically. There's not a, a, a health issue. Um, we've exhausted any kind of leave, anything we can make available to you. Um, now you're going to have to decide, um, are you coming back to work or not? Well, Hunter, thank you so much for your time and your insight and your expertise and, and all the Vistage members you've touched over the years with your concepts and your great ideas. You can always find Hunter's content at hunterlot.com. I'd like to thank all of you who've listened to this webinar today. Thank you for your time. Hopefully we sparked some thinking, gave you some new ideas, and I invite you to stay tuned to our Leading Through Challenging Times webinar series. We've had Patrick Lencioni, we've had Jim Collins, we've got other big names coming up, along with the very, very best of the speakers in our expert community like Hunter Lott. So Hunter, thank you very much. Uh, stay home, stay healthy, and thanks everyone for being part of today's webinar. Thanks, Joe.